It's really hard to impress me with JRPGs nowadays. Being 29 and having played games since I was 6 years old, I played every kind of RPG imaginable. You name the concept, the gimmick, the design, I've seen it all. It's tough to find an innovation that's new and fulfilling to me. However, when Persona 5 was coming out, I saw a countdown online on a Persona game and thought, hmm, this series has a big following. It's really getting around. I should try out Persona 3. And, well, it got me. Okay, well, where do I start with a big fleshed out concept like this? The Persona series is a JRPG series involving having two identities, or two personas if you want to take the joke far enough. On one side, it involves you carrying on with your normal life with high school and improving skills, while the other involves you going to a secret world to prevent some major catastrophe happening to the real world. Both of them contain strong elements of RPG standards. With your high school side, there's a lot of excellent juicy writing involved and your second life is where the magic of the battle system comes blazing to life. But now it's time to choose Persona 3, Persona 4, and Persona 5. Don't make me choose! Please don't make me choose! Actually, Persona 3 can go for one reason 265 floors. 265 floors of that monotonous crap? Persona 3, I love you. You got me into this series. I love the characters. I love the gameplay, but I can't excuse the padding. Now then, Persona 4 and Persona 5. Uh, I've got to choose Persona 4! I had to do it. The first thing I adored from this particular title is that the characters are either really innocent, lovable goofballs, plus I cried the most in this game when I said farewell to the characters when the game ended. These characters are my favorite from the three games. Mind you, this is tough to pin down and explain because the characters in all three games are top tier quality and develop phenomenally. I think it was because of small details like this. I love Yukari Takaba from Persona 3 and on Takamaki from Persona 5. But there are times when Yukari's overwarring personality and on got way too ditzy for me at some points. Chie and Yukiko from Persona 4 were way more enjoyable and reasonable characters to be around than those two. Stuff like that. Next, I really, really appreciate the strong fluidity of the dungeon flow, the music, how the layout changes, and the presentation of the learning curve. Now I know what you're thinking. Doesn't Persona 5 do this way better with the palaces? Don't they have different palaces that have badass themes to remember them for generations to come? To that, I had to say, yes. And Persona 5 was neck and neck with Persona 4, so I had a bloody hard time choosing between the two. But Persona 4 won. Why? Because of these downsides from Persona 5. 1. Mementos was boring for my taste. It kind of dragged in my opinion. Plus, listen to the music. Oh, so boring. Two, the sneaking was kind of tedious after a while and it dragged the game out. Like for example with getting turned into mice in one of the palaces. Oh, I hated that part. Three, I love Persona 5's music, especially with getting a new character and the boss theme, but I happen to like Persona 4's way better overall. Persona 4 is the best for me with dungeon design because it's more interesting than the monotonous passageways from Persona 3. And it's more straightforward to getting things done compared to Persona 5. Again, comparing these three games was... Ugh, it was tough. It was tough. Ah, uh, bite me. <laughs> One last thing, I've got to talk about the amazing learning curve, the customization, and of course, the personas. This isn't just Persona 4, this is the series in general and what makes it so fantastic. Now if you're new to the Persona series like I was a few months ago, it takes time to understand its mechanics. For one, the spells have weird names related to different spells, so it takes time to learn the elements and what the spells do. Another thing is the personas themselves. Think about them as summons from Final Fantasy, but you can customize their abilities and stats, experiment, and fuse them together to get the abilities you want. It's a very strong, unique innovation that got my attention. And that's the best part about the Persona series. It encourages you to experiment with the unknown and it's entirely up to you how you want to build your strategy. 
It's a game that requires you to look and dig deep into the lore to understand it. What social links are the most beneficial to you? What skills should you boost when it comes to your school life? What personas do you want to use? Which ones do you want to dismiss and throw away? Which ones can you combine to get the abilities you want? The customization is probably the best I've ever seen out of any RPG series, period. With that, there is one big downside to the Persona series I have to admit which is why I put it at number 10. It is not beginner friendly. I tried out the normal difficulty in all three games the first time and haha, <laughs> the trial and error can be ruthless for new players. There's a bunch of stuff you need to study about the game beforehand before certain events happen. If you have the wrong social links, if you have the wrong personas, if you build up the wrong strategies, or if you run out of time, let's just say that's where these games push my buttons big time. Anyone here raised up in the 90s? I'm about to blow your nostalgia lid right off. Tony Hawk, Pro Skater. Everyone had these games. They were a teenhood game icon. My friends had it, my cousins had it, I had it. Everyone worshipped this game. Who could resist an appeal like this? You're a superhuman skater soaring up ramps and blasting off every grind rail like the Energizer Bunny. They were get together video game phenomenons and they were easy to get started with and play. So, which Tony Hawk game to consider? This is actually an easy pick. It's time to go underground. First, let's cover the obvious. Tony Hawk games through the years up until 2003 have become more technical, more controller friendly, and flashier as the games keep coming. Past 2003, they've gone way off into the tunnel that won't see the light of day, but that's a different beast for another time. On all fronts, Tony Hawk games kept building their presentation and mechanics into untold limits until a peak to the stars in my opinion in Tony Hawk Underground. Manuals, the caveman, transferring, doing multiple tricks during a technique in skateboarding, it's got everything to make you get high from video game skateboarding. It's all here. They gave you so many ways to break this game that it's unreal, but it feels super fair because of the perfect compensation and difficulty. It's one of those things where it takes the super simple fun of skateboarding and prioritized it way over balancing the game properly with its physics. It's a big reason we love video games in the first place is because it exaggerates reality, right? We don't care how unrealistic it is we just care about how fun it is another distinguishing feature is that well let's talk about why it's called tony hawks underground and not pro skater anymore and that is because it's you now you're not using pro skaters this time around it's a game that revolves around creating your own character their looks their clothes their skateboard it's all yours making the game personal to you along with the other customizable stuff not just that but it also has a climbing up to being a pro skater story that was revolutionary at the time. If you want to go forward with the story and the goals, you can do that. Want to go goof off, free skate, go explore, find hidden areas, or experiment with tricks without a time limit? You can do that too. It's a game about your freedom. It's a phenomenal execution. Now, let's talk about its big reason I ranked it here at number 9. The out of this world replayability with the difficulty. This game has a huge scale of how easy or how hard you want the game to be. You can go from super super easy for someone trying out the series for the first time all the way to what is called the sick difficulty. Let me tell you this sick difficulty is insane and will break even the most seasoned Tony Hawk's players backs. Even mine, but it's what makes it so fun to go back and play this game over and over for. The challenge consistently stays there on repeated playthroughs. It's amazing that the game took into huge consideration of what players would want as a challenge from this game. Because of the sick difficulty, this game is extremely replayable for my taste and keeps the game experience fresh in a game series I adore. And I love it. This is my ninth favorite game of all time. It's time to round up the gang and take the red to the orange line. On the street and the cars Are you ready?
If you've seen my top 25 Sega Genesis games, this is my number one spot, but there's something that's bothering me. In that countdown, I explained thoroughly about one side of me that treasures it dearly, but I didn't talk about the other two reasons why I esteem it so highly. For the sake of redundancy, I won't go over the first reason I explained in that countdown here. So I suggest going there to get the first piece of the puzzle, then coming back here for the other two pieces. Anyways, we've already established the first reason, which is that this game has brought out my hardcore spirit in video games. Acquiring the discipline and skill to push yourself past your limits and become better at video games. So, on to reason number two. It's really immersive and adventurous when RPGs take advantage of my weaknesses in video games. Several times throughout my countdowns, I've said that I'm horrible at navigation. Look at Shining in the Darkness. It's a colossal closed-in dungeon maze. You'll get lost as soon as you go down your fifth hallway. So, since this is a survival RPG game where you have limited resources to hold out for only so long, add that to my weakness constantly pecking at me, guess what's gonna happen? After a while, I'm going to feel helpless, trapped, and then I legitimately ask these questions. Am I going to make it out alive? Am I going to get ambushed by a super enemy and get killed instantly with my low health or resources? I love that feeling because when I picture that feeling of adventure, adventures are not supposed to go your way. They're not vacations where you're supposed to be comfortable and let the game give you all the advantages. They're supposed to be filled with perils and difficulties to slow you down and when the game slows down, you appreciate those moments more. Why do you think that no one talks about happily ever afters in Disney movies? Because it'd make for a wicked boring movie. Now, the last reason is that I have more history with this video game than any other game. When I was 5 or 6 years old, I was over at a friend's house where I saw this game for the first time, and a bunch of teenagers were gathered around the game. Of course, since children get fascinated with what the big kids play in their video games, I checked out the game after they left. I sucked, of course, playing it by myself, but over the years this game kept popping up in my head over my life. When the Nintendo 64 came out, I forgot about it, but when emulators came out, I played it off and on since then. On the next playthrough after a couple of years, I got a little farther, gave up, then on the next playthrough a couple of years later, I got a little farther, gave up, then I kept trying again as the years passed. It was a hard and long game, so this game is very special to me because as I got better at video games, this game was kind of a coming of skill experience. It grew up with me, and like a best friend, I started to understand it more and more. And then in 2011, after several years of not playing it, I decided to take it all the way to the end no matter the cost. It was still a lot bigger of a game than I thought, but I pushed through and whoo. Woo! I finally beat it. I finally beat it. I finally beat it. It was the best feeling in the world in my gaming history. Anyways, as you can tell, this game and I go way back. Number 7 is my second favorite PC game of all time, Raptor Call of the Shadows on DOS. Now people know that I'm rather bold in my countdowns. You know why I'm like that sometimes? I learned this the hard way back in 2008, but when you speak timidly, it gives people the opportunity to walk all over you and even bully you to their advantage. In life, it's important to be confident and be assertive in a friendly way, but at the same time, don't overdo it to hurt people's feelings. Stand on your own two feet, but don't shove. It's not nice. There are those who feel entitled that you need to think like the bandwagon or those that feel that the world's opinion should bow to their personal taste. But they are not friends of mine. Just ignore them. So what bold statement am I going to say about PC games? I can see it. Somebody will say, oh, it's the high-end, high-detail, 60 frames per second PC games that matter. Here's my bold, respectful response. If you like them, that's cool, but I personally don't find any value in modern high-tech PC gaming. I know, that's a burn, but it's the truth. Having grown up in DOS games, the Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, sorry, 
but gameplay was embedded into my blood first before graphics became a higher priority to the enjoyment of video games. This is why I love rudimentary video games like DOS games. It's raw gameplay. It's not about the graphics, it's not about the story, it's a simple press start and you can begin playing. But even by DOS standards, I'm sure plenty of people are curious to say, well why this one? Why not Doom or any revolutionary game? Because as petty as the sounds, the sound effects are the best I've ever heard in a video game and I never get tired of listening to it. Listen to this! It sounds so legitimate that it soaks you into that deep pool of immersion. Have you ever had that experience of being surrounded by that stereo system and then the floodgates of being in the action comes out? This video game does this to me more than any other. Of course, of course, it's not just one reason, but there are a lot of complementary things going on here. The second big reason that I adored this game is the big variety of weapons. It gives you a big selection if you get bored of one weapon and want to keep changing it up and they're rather devious and fun weapons. They just make you feel like one evil devil and it's great. And lastly, just like number 9 with Tony Hawk's Underground, the difficulty is impressive, flexible, and challenging so it has that extra endurance with replayability. I have to admit that if I come back and do a full playthrough of this game every year or two, it holds up for being one of my favorite video games of all time. Splinter Cell is an odd franchise to talk about. On the one hand, it does have its moments with the stealth mechanics that pop it out in a unique way from Metal Gear Solid, but on the other hand, I can easily see why nobody ever talks about it. For one, the first two games, the original and Pandora's Tomorrow, have not aged well. The trial and error gameplay will get some players screaming. It even gets me screaming. To follow that, Double Agent is an inconsistent mess with the story and mechanics and conviction I haven't played yet. Over the years, my faith in Splinter Cell has dwindled pretty bad, but I have to admit there are two games that are excellent. Splinter Cell Blacklist and my number 6 favorite video game and considered the best Tom Clancy video game ever made by many fans, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. To be honest, this is hard to put into perspective if you haven't played Chaos Theory before, but this is the best I have. Now remember playing Resident Evil 4 for the first time. For the first 20 minutes of the game, you're lulled into this false sense of security. So far it looks pretty good, nothing too impressive, then WHOA! The village is attacking, oh my goodness, is that a chainsaw? Oh shit. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? The point is, I can advertise these points to you like from the back of a game box, but if you haven't played it, it doesn't hold a candlestick to the real deal playing it yourself. That's kind of what Chaos Theory is. The thing is, I can brag and rant about how this game is a revolution to the stealth game genre in my opinion, but without playing it, it's not true justice. If you happen to be a fan of stealth games, please go pick it up, because my description will be underwhelming. What I will say is that have you ever wished there was a video game in a genre that was just perfect? Like no glitches, no negative points like trial and error, and expanded on the positives in every conceivable way? That's what Chaos Theory is. It literally decimated every downside to the Splinter Cell series and gave steroids to the positives and blew them through the roof. The hand-to-hand -hand combat is perfection. The heads-up display is everything it needs to be. The trial and error is destroyed, plus there's an on-the-spot save system. The graphics and physics, oh, beautiful. The intricacies involved with every level, mmm, mmm. The variety of stealth tactics and alternative paths, I have no words for it. The aiming is fine-tuned from the other games, it's just endless. I could go on forever. 
However, there is one negative. I know, I contradicted myself, but I have to say why this is number 6. Because everything was poured into the presentation, the gameplay, and the perfection of it, it suffers from a short game time. There aren't a lot of missions and I have to admit the replayability suffers from that. If it was double or triple the length it already is, I'd probably pull this up to number 4. But alas, my number 5 and number 4 spots are way bigger than this game, giving them the justice they need for their rankings. But please, pick this up if you're a fan of stealth. It's definitely worth looking at at the very least. It's now time to announce my favorite RPG of all time. Brace yourselves because this is an RPG game that is on the fence with the gaming community. Some like it, some do not. In order for it to qualify as my favorite RPG, I need these 5 positive points to be there. 1. Hands down, it has to have the best amount of ability customization options I've ever seen. 2. The game time has to be massive, preferably 100 hours or more. 3. Has little to no redundancy or grinding. 4. It can't be a standard JRPG. I'm bored of those and I've seen a million of them. There has to be some innovation of real-time strategy, speed, and action involved. And 5. For a big bonus, I love friendly AI. Call it a guilty pleasure. So what game has these traits in spectacular fashion? Final Fantasy XII! So let's get the negative I hear all the time I agree with and get it out of the way. The story sucks. It's atrocious. Bon and Pinello are not good characters and I don't give a crap about politics. I wish this game endlessly wants to smoosh into your face. But you want to know about something fascinating? You can press the start button and skip it. A cutscene is coming? Cool. Press the start button and skip it. There. Personally, I don't think there's a need to complain about something if you can lock it away from yourself. This is just a personal view, but I don't need to 100% analyze the game if I can scoot the inconveniences aside myself. So let's take this one step at a time, and I'm going to talk about what separates Final Fantasy XII from all the other Final Fantasy games and what I love about it. First, the active dimension battle system is my favorite RPG mechanic of all time because it keeps the pacing perfectly intact and the action is consistent. First, I'm an action gamer. Sue me. I love watching characters actively moving around rather than them standing in a line playing red light green light with the enemy. In other Final Fantasy games when you encounter an enemy, the screen literally jerks you into a separate battle screen, at which I don't mind, but it truly feels like something special when you can approach enemies and enemies can approach you in a genuine way from the environment. It feels good to be surrounded in a natural environment to battling rather than getting yanked into this one static environmental screen to do battle. The second point is, of course, the customization, the variety of tactics, and friendly AI. Oh my goodness. Look, I know friendly AI is shunned in the video game community. Call it a massive guilty pleasure of mine. Maybe because I'm fascinated with how video games program intelligence, but there is a smorgasbord of customizing your friendly AI in this game. What's really impressive about it is the attention to detail on what you want them to do and when to do it. You can literally design your own friendly AI down to the smallest details. You can manufacture your AI buddies to perfectly synchronize to your your own style of play. I've just never seen anything like it. Why don't games ever do this? Lastly, the difficulty, the exploration, and the massive size of the game world, the game time, and the amount of times the game improvises you to change up your game is incredible. The main quest, going after the hunts, it never gets old, the journey is adventurous and long, and I remember finishing it. And it does have mixed reviews for Final Fantasy fans, but this one was tailor made for me, through and through. Gotta love personal taste.
So, now we're in the territory of Metal Gear Solid. Oh boy, uh, we're gonna drag this out like a Metal Gear Solid 2 Codec conversation call, no offense, so let's just get to my favorite game. It just take way too long to talk about which ones are better than others. Alright, Metal Gear Solid 5, you're up. Now, hold on, hold on, slow down. I know what some of you are thinking and you have your rebuttals ready, but let me be frank with you and this is going to sound nuts. I truly believe there are times where weighing out the positives versus the negatives of a game are not relevant in determining the enjoyment out of a game. Yes, as in I'm saying that reviewing a game is sometimes completely pointless. Here's why I think that. I'll give you an example. Let's look at The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Despite that the game has negative points like having less dungeons than other Zelda games, the Triforce Hunt being a chore, and the slow sneaking into the Forbidden Fortress, I hear very often often from some Zelda players that The Wind Waker is their all-time favorite video game without question. Despite the negatives. Don't you find that kind of odd? Theoretically, in reviewing a game, you should say there's this positive and that positive, then there's that negative and that negative, and you would give it a, I don't know, an 8 out of 10, and you would assume that's how other people should judge a game. But I truly believe that if someone reaches a euphoria state with video games, they can completely shut down the negatives out of a video game and break them completely. Think about this, Ocarina of Time is considered the best video game of all time by some despite the water temple being there, which is a giant gaping weakness in it by the fans. Resident Evil 4 is considered the best game of all time by some and it has Ashley in it for about a third of the game and people religiously complain about her. Remember, the end goal of a review is to judge the positives and negatives in how you would recommend the game to others, but it's never the final answer. In the end, it could mean that negatives aren't worth a damn if the positives are highlighted well enough for a gamer. Nobody can account for another person's individual's tastes. It's not possible. So, with Metal Gear Solid 5, you can list the negatives all you want, and I truly respect your feelings and viewpoints, but the positives in this game overpower me to the point where the negatives don't really affect me. All video games have negatives. It's a universal fact, yet everybody has a favorite game of all time. Anyway, sorry to drag that out, but Metal Gear Solid 5 does have its share of negatives, so that's my stance on it. It take forever to address each one, so that's my short story on it. Anyways, let's talk about something more important and why I rank this game up so high. Now you've heard pretty much the basics behind this game. It's completely open world, it's flexible in how you want to approach your stealth missions, the amount of detail put into every small mechanic, it's great. But to be honest, there's a deeper meaning for my enjoyment of this game. As much as I don't want to admit this because I'm a peacemaker, there's a modern gaming trend that I despise that goes around our gaming community today. Playing old games like Doom, Duke Nukem, GoldenEye, and those classics, I'm a huge faithful fan of FPS and TPS games. I adored the balance back then between exploration and snappy, fluid gameplay. However, first person shooters nowadays, and yes, I'm pointing at Call of Duty, is more heavily focused on multiplayer rather than the campaigns in recent years, and linear stages are thrown about like chocolate on Christmas Day, and you know what? I really don't like that change of emphasis nowadays. Days. Now, I get the appeal that Call of Duty is awesome for some casual, fast-paced gaming night party entertainment, especially with zombies in the Black Ops days, but in the process it leaves old school FPS fans in the dust waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and I'm tired of waiting. Call of Duty comes every year, and don't get me wrong, Far Cry, Skyrim, and Fallout are ambitious action-adventure titles with RPG elements that the community can sink their teeth into, but they don't have the same speed, finesse, and style that Doom once had. When will exploration ever come back in a first-person or third-person shooting game?
So you see, this isn't about comparing one Metal Gear Solid title to another. It's more about the timing of when this game came out and it bringing hope from a genre that I desperately needed. The reason I adore Metal Gear Solid 5 is because it gave me faith that somebody gives a damn in this desolate land of linear shooter games. Metal Gear Solid 5 restored that balance of emphasis of exploration, options, and keeping the gunplay spot on. It keeps my soul intact knowing that somebody did care. Thanks Kojima. I'm sorry for what Konami did to you, and your parting gift will never be forgotten. Everybody has relaxation habits. It's a healthy way to reduce stress. After a long day at work or school, maybe it's a stressful task or had a long day of activities, it's nice to take a breather. When we all feel stress, naturally it becomes like carbonated soda in a bottle when you shake it. Over time, your body starts to feel the pressure and push it far enough, you'll literally burst your cork in a rather interesting but unproductive way. Of course, some gamers relieve the stress by playing laid-back video games. It could be Harvest Moon, it could be the Chow Garden from Sonic Adventure 2, Stardew Valley, Journey, Minecraft, Animal Crossing, Farmsville, and of course, can't forget The Sims, my favorite series of all time. Explaining why I like The Sims in itself is pretty straightforward. I love friendly AI as I mentioned in Final Fantasy XII. I adore character development mechanics and watching each Sim become their own individual. Maybe it's because I love psychology and social work, and I love tinkering with some environments with my creative side. It's always a joy to get inventive in creating new houses and mixing things up. Plus, it gets challenging and fun to support 8 starting Sims on a basic budget, but very worthwhile to succeed at self-made challenges like that. After thinking about it for a while, I think the main reason I love this series is because I really like pets. My heart melts around playing and interacting with pets of all kinds. Cats, dogs, hamsters, you know it. Like pets, sims like to do their own thing. They're adorable to watch, I never get tired of their natural funny antics, and you can choose to interact and play with them if you wish. So with that out of the way, why Sims 3? The Sims and The Sims 2 are distinguished successes in their own right, but why is the the third installment special. What makes Sims 3 my favorite is the incredible, incredible versatile options you have to work with to keep one experience unique from the next to keep their replayability on fire. And you have endless amounts of tools to keep one game session in immortality. For one, easily the biggest and most fluid and ambitious feature is that you're not limited to just your house to play at at once. You can literally send out your sims to different activities around the neighborhood and keep an eye on all of them at once, and the game still runs in real time. That that's rather baffling, and it's a nice insurance to make sure you always have stuff to do. Plus, there are no loading screens while you explore the grand scale of the environment. What? What? How did they do that? How did they do that? The second feature is that Sims 3 has a lot of expansion packs to really take the game into more intriguing mechanics. It's true that some are focused on aesthetics like the different seasons and Halloween themes, which is honestly a nice touch, but then you come across the ones that add a whole new dimension to playing. There are expansions where you can literally send your sim off to a college university, its own separate world I should add, and there's one where you can literally head off into the future along with some future tech. Though I have to be honest, those items break the game because they're overpoweringly useful. I also killed a sim with a jetpack who didn't have good jetpack skills. <laughs> yeah, wow. The point is that I think of it as having more choices of ice cream flavors. You could have the standard vanilla and chocolate, but having more choices past that makes each return trip a new thing to experiment with, to keep coming back with for more. Lastly, the modding community behind this game. Oh my. Goodness, they know how to breathe new life into this game. After playing The Sims 3 by the package for a while, naturally things get predictable and somewhat repetitive. Happens with every video game out there. You can't avoid that. So, I try out some modding tools, especially the one where the Sims start to branch out in their social interactions and... Oh 
my gosh, it's the cherry on top for the whole experience. It feels good to know that programmers outside of the sim staff know how to add that touching layer from the player's perspective to make it all the more special. What makes it number 3 is that this is my religious go-to relaxing game. Whenever I want to play video games but get tired out from the fast video games, because you know I like to play hardcore video games, this is the one. If I'm having a bad day like from school or work, this game is my therapy safety net. So yes, I grew up with this series and Sims 3 is the pinnacle of that experience. Anyone miss the arcades? I sure do. Unfortunately, arcades are on the edge of extinction, but back in the 90s, they brought us some fun times, and I really miss them. Now we've come across what I consider the best revolutionary mechanic of all time from video games, and it came from the arcade. So, what started it all? What was the most influential rhythm game to date? If you were around arcades before they died out, this game popped out like a sore thumb. We analyze a lot of things in video games, peripherals, graphics, controls, gameplay, but in the end, I believe the single most important factor in video games is having fun. And that's the make all break all reason I put this at number two. Dance Dance Revolution is a lot of fun and a blast to play. Reflecting on all of my years of gaming, I did not give this game a second thought in putting it here. The problem here is, what can I expand on about this game to you guys? It's as straightforward as it gets. You play a song, you tap your feet to the arrows, and you just rock out. Nothing else needs to be said. I saw it in an arcade one time, decided to try it, and the rest is history. To be frank, I had a script here with a lot of BS earlier, but I seriously think this is one of those rare times where overanalyzing something so simple doesn't do it any favors. And that's what makes DDR so special. It's incredibly beginner friendly, it's incredibly accessible, and it's incredibly simple. But I will offer up one thing. Because DDR is hard to find nowadays, now that games like the Just Dance games have taken the front row seat in rhythm games, if you'd like to try it out, you can look up Step Mania online. It's the same thing except doing it with your fingers, and it's surprisingly addicting. Though it is hard to set up unless you know how to install things like the right songs from the right sides into the right folders. It's one of those customizable games you can put stuff in folders in order to add to it. I highly recommend that. It's a blast to play. But otherwise, there you go. Uh, I gotta find an arcade with a DDR machine in it nowadays. I know they're out there. I'll find you someday. I gotta play you again. <laughs> Are you ready? So, my favorite console of all time is the Nintendo 64. That will narrow it down. My favorite genre of all time is the action and shooter genre. That will narrow it way more down. Wait a second. That leaves two popular games. You know what they are. My favorite game, or games of all time, is GoldenEye 007 and Perfect Dark on the Nintendo 64. I... I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't pick one game over the other. Every time I consider it, my blood goes cold. I love and adore these games equally in different ways. I worship GoldenEye 007 for its nostalgic value and Perfect Dark for its technical advancements from GoldenEye. I remember that day in fourth grade when I rented GoldenEye and played Silo as my first ever level from this game. Do you know what happened to me? I immediately went to my mom and started to relentlessly beg for her to get me the game. I didn't stop. I kept going and going at it for a couple of weeks until she bought me the game. Looking back, it wasn't a nice thing to do, but that's commitment to how much something means to a person. I did not do the same thing with Perfect Dark, but I did whatever I could to get the game as soon as possible. It was a hassle getting the expansion pack for this game for Majora's Mask and for Donkey Kong 64 to work, let me tell you. I wonder if anyone remembers those days. So, let's get to the meat at what makes GoldenEye and Perfect Dark the 
masterpieces that they are. I'm kind of surprised. I seriously think a lot of gamers have forgotten why these games are revolutions and why they still are, in my opinion. I think after two decades and a lot of FPS games, I think it's been overlooked. So, let's ask this question. What do old school FPS games lack that these two games have? Next, what do modern FPS games lack that these two games have? Answer those two questions and you'll see why GoldenEye and Perfect Dark are the perfect bridging gap balanced FPS shooters that everyone reveres it for. So let's go back to Doom. Doom, as much of an awesome game it is in its own right, is lacking these things. Realism, objectives, and intricate AI detail. I'll get back to that in a second. Now what are modern FPS shooters lacking? Free roaming with objectives, cover based shooting, and hand holding strategies like regenerating health. Even Metal Gear Solid 5 is guilty of those last two problems. So let's look at these six mechanics. With realism starting from Doom, you go from simply shooting the whole body to accounting for shooting at different body parts to get different results when encountering enemies. Doom, of course, has no objectives, just get to the exit, simple as that. We all know GoldenEye and Perfect Dark involves being mindful of objectives to progress, leading to immersion to the game world and its levels. And naturally, Doom simply has enemies that attack you, and that's it. With the two games, you have to watch for stealth, alarms, and even different weapons like the rocket launchers from Streets on GoldenEye. You see the pattern yet? Most modern games are obvious. You don't roam around freely to achieve objectives. It's usually one straight path. Cover-based shooting is nice, but it's one-dimensional strategic behavior when carried across several levels, leading to padding. And then when you have hand-holding strategies like regenerating health where you literally have players hug a wall to solve a problem, uh-uh. Having easy problems with easy solutions leads to no fulfillment. This is what I revere about Rare, like with Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64. They know the perfect balance of what works with the old and integrating it with the new so that it becomes a priceless treasure of a video game to come. Even today, after two decades, these games are still talked about relentlessly. I miss Rare. Every time I play GoldenEye or Perfect Dark, it's one of those few games that I'll never get tired of playing. Because no other game will ever match that finesse with the balance these two games contribute. So it gives me great honor to stand tall and proudly announce that GoldenEye 007 and Perfect Dark are my favorite video games of all time. I love them dearly with all my heart. Finally, I got my top 20 favorite video games of all time done. Thanks for being patient with me. Spending three months with the top 20 Zelda games, oh, it was a doozy. It burned me out bad. Not doing that again. Thanks for watching and I'll see you with the top 25 Nintendo games for the next countdown. Ciao.